And so ultimately, those are no longer things for us to be ashamed of, but things that we can hold out to other people and say, look how powerful my God is. He took all of these things wrong in my life. He took these laws that said correctly that I was guilty of sin and deserving of death. And he put those under his subjugation because he loved me so much. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. All right, Chaplain's Report today, as I'm sure most of you could have predicted, is going to revolve around similar things that we've been talking about today already. And it's going to be primarily on this one passage from Colossians. And it talks about how Paul dealt with Christians arguing, because as you remember at the top of the show, one of the things that we were discussing is this sort of rift between the dispensationalist and the replacement theologist on uh, within the realm of Protestantism. And so I thought it might be useful to talk about a passage that specifically deals with Christians while they were arguing with one another. And Paul does this masterfully in the book of Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. So we see here, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have all been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, in this particular passage, what we see is a start with a simple warning. And it's very eloquent, as Paul usually is, but it really all boils down to one thing. Remember who's in charge. Don't be caught up by the philosophy of men or empty deception or the traditions of men or any of that stuff. God's the one in charge. Listen to him. Don't listen to men. When you boil it down, that's really all that warning is saying. Remember who you answer to. It's not men. You don't have to please them. You don't have to work. They're not going to be able to have any say whatsoever in your eternal destination. If you want to actually talk and argue about the things that matter, you ultimately have to remember that God is in charge and he's the one that decides these things. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't times where we shouldn't argue, where we shouldn't hash things out and discuss them. I wouldn't be a professional arguer if I didn't believe that that had value. But what it does say is, if you're going to be arguing about something, make sure it's over something that God actually cares about. If you're going to harm your relationship or at least potentially harm your relationship with a brother, make sure that the reason he's upset with you is because you preach the truth of God's word, not because of your personal preference or a preacher or a, uh, a rabbi in their case that you really, really like and, and you want to say that, that that one's better than the one that he likes or something like that. Ultimately, God's the one in, that is in charge. And so don't go out following vain philosophies or uh, empty deceits or anything like that. Ultimately, what you need to do is be constantly focused on pleasing God and doing things that are pleasing in his sight. If you are arguing about something that has to do with that, that's okay. But don't get caught up in these endless arguments about things that are ultimately a matter of opinion. That's what Paul is talking about. So ultimately, you follow God not the elementary principles of the world or other men. And it also establishes why Jesus Christ is the correct answer. So as Paul typically does, he gives a command and then he gives an explanation for the command. So you've got the original rationale, be worried about the things that God's worried about, and then he gives the reason why. So if you'll look in that verse, you'll notice that what he's actually talking about there is that you took a vow, you made a promise, when you became a follower of Christ. 
You sealed that promise with the baptism. You took that vow to be his. You were buried with him and you rose up in newness of life as a new person. And you have to live that out. You have to live as though you really are a new creature. And so because you took those vows, did you take those vows to Paul? No. Did you take those vows to Apollos? No. Did you take those vows to your local elder or deacon that you like? No. Uh, did you take those vows to your minister? No. You took those vows to Christ. And so he's the only one that gets to dictate the terms of that covenant. When you gave your life over to him, you forfeited your own life. And now he's the one that gets to dictate those things to you. And so because of that, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to spend all of your time arguing about which philosophy, which is rooted in something a guy thought up, is actually the correct one. So if we were to go back and apply that to the discussion we were having at the beginning, if we're talking about replacement theology or dispensational theology, does it make a lot of sense to argue about which preacher is preaching those things correctly? No. Does it make an awful lot of sense to figure out which one of those theologies is true or not? Yeah, that matters a lot. And so ultimately, just don't get caught up in the side arguments. Focus on the main thing and actually pleasing God and figuring out what, what, is according, what is right according to God's word and God's dictates, not those of mankind. You see, your only hope for this life is to share in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so let's go on and look at a, another verse here that is directly after the ones that we just finished reading in Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15, as Paul wraps this idea up. He says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So when we're talking about our relationship to the old law, again, as I said, I, I view it as scaffolding. It is something that Paul refers to as a tutor, something that we can learn from. But we're no longer under that, and that verse explains why. When Christ went to the cross, the old law was nailed to it with him. All the edicts and things that showed why we were unrighteous and unworthy of God's salvation and mercy, all of which is true, by the way. There's not a, a part of that that is in any way untrue. But when Christ died on the cross, he nailed it to that cross so that it can no longer be used against us. You see, it's not because we were able to adhere to the law better than we did before. It's that even through that frailty and through that inadequacy, that it doesn't matter anymore because Jesus died for us. That's ultimately the point of what, what, Jesus, or what, what Jesus is saying there through the pen of Paul, is that because Jesus took that for us, he died in our place to forgive us of our sins. That's ultimately the reason he gets to tell us what to do now. He bought us at a very high price. And because of that, that edict that said that we don't belong to him, that we are incapable of salvation, that we have sinned, we have gone against God, and because of that, there is no hope for us of salvation or living eternally with him. All of it was true. And it was all nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ. His death is the only reason we get to forego that. And that's why I say the old law is not done away with or replaced. It's still there. It's just been fulfilled through the promise of Christ. The old law wasn't done away with. It was just nailed to the cross so that through his death, it no longer can be used against us. It wasn't abolished. And Jesus really died to free us of that old law, which was impossible for us to uphold. And the Jews get that same covenant. In the same way that we are afforded the blessing of no longer being under the old law, the Jews get the same deal. They have the ability to have their sins and the edicts that were written against them nailed to the cross just like we do. They don't have any special status in the kingdom. But they also have the same opportunity afforded to us that, that we have right now. And so because of that, they are able to share in the Abrahamic covenant just like we are. You see, they're getting a better covenant too. 
And ultimately, that's the idea that is being presented here, that Paul uses that sort of symbolism we see in verse 15. You remember, if you were to go back to it real quick, and we'll just look at it again real quickly, you'll see at the end there, he says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So what is that talking about? Well, in the olden days, back when this was being written, one of the things that a king would do when he conquered a people is he would take the captives and he would parade them through the city on a victory tour. So like your king goes away for a little while, he conquers the people, he brings back the prisoners, and part of his return parade, which would celebrate his victory over his enemies, is that he would make a public display of those he conquered. He would actually parade the ca captives through the streets to show, this is my might, this is my power, see how powerless they are, they were powerless against me, I conquered them, I took them out of commission, they have no power over you anymore, your enemies no longer have any threat to you whatsoever because of my power, because of what I did for you. That's what the king was essentially saying by parading them through the streets. He's saying, my people no longer have to worry about these people because I conquered them. And that's exactly what is going on here. The old law, it had a stake against us because it showed how unrighteous we were. It showed that we were doomed to die in our sins because there was no way for us to overcome them. Doesn't matter because the king came and he conquered it. Therefore, he has put them in public display as a glory, as a thing to show off, saying that this is what has been done. These are the people that were lost in their sin, and now I have put that sin, I have put their enemies under captivity and subjugation because of my glory and because of my ability to do that. So ultimately, that's the sort of symbolism that he is drawing on. So Jesus, he did die. So both Gentiles and Jews no longer had to deal with that anymore. They didn't have to be subject to the law and didn't have to be subject to the death that followed the inability to follow that law. And that's not something we should shy away from. That's something we should rejoice in. So no longer is the sin and the things that we're having to deal with something to be ashamed of, but ultimately it's something we can brag about because Jesus put those things under his subjection. He has nailed those edicts to the cross and he has made them a public display. So that even the evil things that we did in our previous life are something that can glorify him in the same way that Paul knew that very well. Remember that Paul was a murderer that put Christians to death just for proclaiming the name of Christ. And he became one of his greatest advocates. He's the person writing the passage that we're reading right there. And so ultimately, those are no longer things for us to be ashamed of, but things that we can hold out to other people and say, look how powerful my God is. He took all of these things wrong in my life. He took these laws that said correctly that I was guilty of sin and deserving of death. And he put those under his subjugation because he loved me so much. And so when we look at these doctrinal differences and these issues that we have, ultimately, as long as they are something that, as long as they are something that is genuinely something that God cares about, they are something that, you know, maybe even we were wrong on. Everything has been put in subjugation under him because ultimately the thing that we're supposed to take away from that is that he ultimately is our king and we should subject ourselves to him, not to the traditions or sayings of men, because he is the one that conquered sin and death for us. Stay the course, friends. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me, I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others. This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat.